All right. So, talking about planetary annihilation titans. Who, who here played planetary annihilation? Saw the Kickstarter video at least? Saw the trailer for either of the games? Good, the trailer, yeah, that's, we, we set expectations so high with that. It was all in-game footage, I mean, but, but our artists were amazing at putting together cinematics. And in some ways, that came back to bite us. All right, so my focus on Titans is design. And really, it's just the process of design as viewed through the lens of that particular year of development. What we were doing, we were addressing a lot of community concerns with the state of the game at launch. They had loved the game right up until we declared it released. And then when we declared it released, oh, that was, well, they, they didn't like that too much because there were a lot of issues with it still. And there were. The, the internal reasoning is just, well, this is a better product than we would have given to, to a publisher. This is more on target than anything anybody inside of the company had ever worked on before. And they thought that would fly with Kickstarter. And no, no. When, when, when you make promises to, to players, you, you have a checklist. You know, just, just make sure. So the position we came into this from is that we had to simultaneously rekindle the love of the community, ideally put something out in time before money ran down too badly, and, well, make something we were passionate about because the long slog of getting the game to launch had started to, well, it starts to demoralize you. There are so many bugs to squash. There are so many little features where you're just trying week after week after week to cut memory use and, and, and get the UI elements to be where you want them to be. Uh, we, we, we used HTML and CSS for the interface overlay, and that's actually all moddable. That was part of the motivation there. But we also then inherited all of the issues that come with HTML and CSS and JavaScript, in addition to a, a, an extremely elaborate home-rolled engine that can do some pretty incredible things. It, it, it was a great engine, but most of what was great was back behind the scenes, and players didn't feel it. And so where we were sitting was, well, how do we take what we know is great about this game underneath and bring it out to where players are going to enjoy it? All right. So the main thing at this point is we know we have to make a launch because we're not getting additional, uh, additional funding. You know, you, once you go out to Steam, you have your launch day, you have a couple of sales, and that's really where your income is coming in. So we know at this point that we have to understand the product we're trying to produce from the beginning, and we have to hone in on it like a laser. But this is a challenge because, of course, everything in design, everything in development is exploratory. So we have engineers constantly working on additional features that we need. So the big, the big uh, the big pull with Titans were the Titans. We have these huge super units that sit between the traditional gameplay of, of Planetary Annihilation, which is just a real-time strategy with basic resource management. The main design constraint there is just player attention. If you can play en pay enough attention, you can build a bigger army, manage more robots, and annihilate your enemy. Where at the very big scale, we already had things like planetary destruction, which sounds big enough, but really the scale gap that creates presented some issues in terms of like, well, okay, great, we just blew up a whole planet. That's fun the first five times, but we need something that is more dynamic, more interesting. And so we went for Titans, these huge robots that would effectively win the game for you if you were playing on a single planet battle. And, well, it went quite nicely. 
So the thing about this, though, is that you're dealing with the reality of what your engineers and your artists are capable of producing each week. You're actually stuck responding constantly to the issues they have. So it's not, it's not just that you say, well, we need titans. Well, OK, if we want a titan that can destroy a planet, well, it's going to have to be able to issue notifications. It's going to have to have all the server communication written for it. It's going to have to deal with issues about cleanup. You know, there, there are robots all over the surface of the planet. And if you destroy it and they're still there, or even for a frame after the explosion, it looks weird. But if, if you, so, so they're taking this time for something that sounds on paper, easy, it should be extremely easy. We already had planet destruction. We wanted a Titan to destroy a planet. Yay. Well, no. OK. So once this kind of feedback starts coming from the engineers and the artists, you're stuck saying, what really matters to us? What are we trying to get out of this? All right. And at the very worst, you're having features that just simply cannot make it in. You, you thought there were going to be easy wins. Right? So for instance, we figured we'd be able to improve, uh, improve combat notifications to a degree that the system just kept pushing back against. We thought that we would be able to hit more of the performance targets. Well, OK. You know, we, we did quite well, actually. But you, know, you, you are, are going to be thrown obstacles constantly. And all you get to do is say, all right, we're changing our mind now. So a big one like this is, is we have uh, planet smashes. Planets go hurtling into each other, and it's all very exciting. And when they're done, uh, originally, we would leave a, a crater on the surface of the planet. Right? A big crater. But the problem is, in that long push to the original launch, we had had to have so many workarounds uh, in, in our pathing system that by the time we tried to integrate the, the, the mesh for the crater into the planet, the only thing we could do was make it entirely unpathable, which was totally wrong and defeated the point of having the crater there. You know, it's, it's nice visually to have a big crater on a planet. So instead of forcing the engineers to fix that, because we were told that that would take several weeks of their time, and even then be uh, you know, a real crapshoot. We just went ahead and made it so that smashing planets together would destroy the planets. And it's, it's not ideal. It's not what we would have preferred. But hey, it worked. And we ended up having it entirely beautiful, because we had a, a great technical artist who was capable of, of making those kinds of effects. So you, you turn, I mean, uh, you, you, you turn, well, I don't want to fall back on the cliche, but you make lemonade with your lemons, right? All right. But the most important thing is to recognize that as a designer, you, you first think you're just making game experiences. But you are, of course, doing that in, in a human mind. You're, you're trying to piece together bits of a puzzle that a person is going to interpret as something actually happening in a real world somewhere. And the more you think about how that works, the weirder it gets. Because people are actually responding to just these little tokens on the screen, none of which are exciting on their own. You know, People don't just load up a game and play the victory fanfare and say, ha, that was great. You know, they, they don't do that. And, and, and so we know that as designers. We know how to craft an arc. We know how to put things together in a way that creates value and meaning and, and striving and effort. But we're also doing that up against the technology constraints. More importantly, we're doing it in the context of everybody's pet features, the things that everybody loves making. So for, for Titans, we had nearly 30 people on the team, so a mid-size company, but enough people that if you're not paying attention to what people are happy about and unhappy about, you're going to miss a lot of potential. right? What you're ultimately trying to find is not what's the best game experience. It's what's the best game experience we can make with the technology we're capable of producing 
with the actual people who are going to be populating that. So we took constant feedback from the artists especially. You know, do you like the units you're making? Are you enjoying the titans that we've asked you to design? And sometimes they'd say, well, no, this will actually be more interesting if I can change how it looks. And then we say, well, OK, we're going to adapt to that and, and make it behave a little differently. And once you get it into play testing, you know, you, you'll, you'll find that things aren't what you initially wanted. They're, they're better. And, and people are having a great time because it's exciting. You know, That's, that's the point. Um, but but the, this key that, that you're not focused on the game world. You're focused on the production process. That's where your mind needs to be. Everything else is a step away from that. So, well, you also have to guess what you're going to need in the future in time. So we ended up putting in an improved system designer for Titans. It was a, a great wish list item. We wanted it, players wanted it. Previously, we had made it so that you could generate whichever planets you wanted, but the, the automatic generator, the, the procedural generator built into the game would make them all for you. You could tweak your seed and change some parameters, but ultimately you got what you got. And so the only thing you could really play with were the celestial mechanics. You know, do I want to have two moons around one planet? Do I want to have five planets? Do I want to have a bunch of gas giants? Gas giants with normal planets for moons? Do I, okay, it's, it's neat, but it, it's basically combinatorial. It's just, you know, once people think it through, they find the, the ones they like, and they play on those all the time. And we didn't have anything in place to allow placement of features on the planets manually. And the reason for that was that, well, the game takes place on a sphere. And, and so to, to build that tool out required us to basically make a 3D modeling tool. And that's not easy. You know, there are a lot of little issues with how you move things around on the surface. How do you, how do you position them? And, and the game does, the engine performs a pre-processing phase to put all the geometry together when it starts. That's how it runs smoothly in spite of just the immense amount of material, the, the immense amount of geometry in place, well, you can't do that in real time. So if you're trying to drag something around, you have to have something to represent it instead of the original. And all of those have to be settled. Well, once we did it, oh, it was pretty obvious. We wish we had done it a year earlier. You know, I mean, for all of the work it took, for all of the pushback in terms of production schedules, for how logical it was to put it off, if we'd had it sooner, we could have put out content that was just more exciting sooner. And that was a huge lesson for us, but you know, you, you, you do what you can. So you, you have to guess ahead of time what you're going to want and what players are going to want. And you have to go ahead and sometimes prioritize things that seem impractical or overly expensive at a time when you don't think you can do them. All right, finally, we had this huge body of legacy code. I mean, I, I call it legacy code just because in terms of the design process, these things had gone in for good engineering reasons or historical reasons or just guesses about what the design was going to unfold as. A large portion of the game's history, we had engineering pursuing a big picture design without a lot of specific feedback. We didn't have that as well integrated as we later learned we needed to. And as a result, we had a lot of features that were really cool that didn't mesh together perfectly. So one of the things that we were saddled with right, is, is these, this really interesting orbital system for getting ships from one planet to another, carrying your units. And it was put together as a simplification of real celestial dynamics. That's neat. It was fun for the, an engineer to put together. But from a player's point of view, it's just, well, here's a fixed, time, a fixed timer on the transit time between planets, and you don't get to adjust it. You, know, you cannot, as a designer, as a player, as anyone, you can't do anything to make it so that two planets have shorter transit times. 
and that makes sense. In the real world, you couldn't do that, but in a game, you kind of want to be able to. Give yourself magical powers as a designer. Always, always give yourself magical powers. And any time anyone starts to bring science into the conversation, plug your ears and do a little dance. You know, you do, don't, don't, don't listen. Because science eh, does pretty well in the real world, but uh, no place in games. No, except for Kerbal. That's, that's great. But um, so another place where this came up is, is with our aiming arcs, right? So you got, you got your little guys, and they're going pew, pew, pew at each other. And on the ground, you know, we, we want basically just a parabolic arc, and that's, that's nice, but they're not on flat planes. I mean, this, this needs to be something where we're accommodating a huge amount of, of curvature, and we just didn't have anyone work out the math on that in time. I mean, they should have been following elliptical paths instead of, instead of parabolic paths. And as a consequence, we ended up not being able to include planetoids that were smaller than a certain size. Yeah, and, and small planetoids are a lot of fun because guys are looping around and zipping around on this interesting space where it's like, my base is over here, but you've just destroyed it. Now my base is over here because I was rebuilding it. And before anyone knows, it just, yeah, it's exciting. It's great. It's also a little bit confusing until you figure out how to navigate on a sphere. That's a, a whole other thing I'm going to come to in a minute. But the point ends up being that we have the, these great little features that kind of don't add up properly. So uh, another one is that we, we don't have a unit cap. This is a major selling point of the original game, of the original Kickstarter. As many units as you want to build. OK, that sounds great until you start to think you're going to have to manage them if that's actually a good strategy. I mean, if, if it's a good move to build a whole lot of units, then you're going to be moving a whole lot of units around. And that, that gets tiresome. Player, players don't think this way automatically. If you ask them, they'll always say, I, I don't want any limits. Give me, give me, give me the biggest possible map. Give me, give me all the units. Okay, some of them are getting more sophisticated now. You know, so a, a lot of people are aware of the, the, the challenges in design, but they're always going to tell you what they think they want, and what they really need to be given is the illusion of what they're saying. You need to find a way to make it so they don't hit a unit cap. It's not about not having one. You can have one if your technology needs it. You can leave it out if it doesn't. Our engine didn't need a unit cap, but we needed a way to, to not need one. And we didn't really have that. So people were building these huge armies that then, well, they didn't have the, the, the network throughput for. They didn't have the attention to, to control. And in general, we just needed a way out. And that, again, was addressed with Titans. Because if, if, if he's building a whole bunch of little robots, I'm just going to build one big robot and go roll over them all. And they're going to go, ah! And then it's going to be brilliant. There are going to be explosions everywhere. And, and then I win. Because he wasted all his metal on a bunch of little robots that don't do any good. OK. So the thing is, as I'm talking about this, th there's this impression that you're doing everything. Y you're not. You, you can't. OK, so th think about some of the stories you've probably heard. Who who's heard of the, the, the one about designers and doors? Have, have you heard that? OK. So, so I don't know who to attribute this to originally. But you know, if there's going to be a door in a game, the question is, what does it do? What does it do to enemies? Can they walk through it? Who can walk through it? When? You know, can, can they break it down? Can I break it down? Does every door have to be a real door? Can some of them just be background? If some of them are background, what interactivity do I have to have on it in order to make it clear that it's just background? Is it OK to have a background door if I give the player a sledgehammer or an ax? Is it acceptable if the door is really just flat? Or do I need to have good geometry for the handle? You know, th there are a lot of questions, and they all come down to, well, they all come down to design. What are you using it for? What are the sounds going to be like? What is, what is the interface going to be on that? OK, you do everything, but you obviously don't actually do any of those things. The sound guy does the sounds, and your, your programmers are, are putting together the logic, the game logic for the door. The artists are producing the assets. 
Okay. So the point is, in order to, to, to deal with the need for design, to have its hands in everything, you have to get your hands off of everything. You have to accept the fact that what you're molding is a flowing stream. It's a living thing. It's, it's, it's like gardening instead of like engineering. If you come into it with the mindset that you're building your picture-perfect cathedral, which might be a poor example because cathedrals were so organic, um, you're, you're going to be disappointed every single time, and so will players. They're going to feel it. They're going to feel that you're forcing things into place. It'll feel plastic. So what, 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 what do you do instead? Well, it's people. You, you have to talk to the people on your team. You have to know all of them. You have to know what your musician is doing. You have to know what your artists are doing. You have to understand what your engineer's concerns are. Why don't they like the features that you're asking them to implement? And if you understand enough technically to be able to really listen to what they're saying, you're going to notice when they're misinterpreting you, too, which is great, because that happens all the time. Everyone has a slightly different vision, and you need to start to know what each person is going to make grow in the game, and you need to know who you're asking to do things. And this is something that was really hit and miss for us, but honestly, it was a great team to work with. And, and everything came together on, on schedules that are practically unheard of. I mean, really, there were turnarounds that I'm still stunned by, asking people to put together a model, and, and it's, it, it's modeled and rigged and textured in a couple of days in the middle of ordinary pipeline work that's passing through. Uh, they, they, they were passionate. They were excited. And, and you need to have that. But the way you have that is you don't take someone who loves doing pathfinding and force them to work on the UI. You don't take someone who wants to be designing robots, because that's what their dream is, and, and tell them to put together all the rocks, you know? Like, because that's not, it, it depends. You know, some, some people just like doing art. And, and a person like that, if they're on your team, use them. You know, use them to do the stuff other people don't want to do, but throw them some of what they really love, too. You know, make sure you're not abusing that. And the last thing is, as a designer, you're going to be picking up the slack. You have to. You know, so, so if you can find the things that people don't like doing that you really think need to be done, just do them. And depending on the team structure, I mean, if you're three or four people, this isn't an issue. But if you're three or four people, you probably don't have a dedicated designer anyway. So at that point, it's pretty obvious what you're going to be doing. But once you get up to 12, 15 people, well, it's a little bit harder, you know? Um, so what you're going to be doing this is the Ragnarok. This, this Titan destroys planets. And this down here is one of our uh, Steam trading cards. <laughs> and, and those were an interesting story in themselves because we had a need to produce them at one of the tightest times in our, our, in our production. We had everyone working on, on important performance fixes, bug fixes, additional content. And we needed to come up with a way to get our, our trading cards put together. And that involved just negotiation with everybody. You know, who has good imagery in place that they're ready to finalize that they haven't brought to our attention yet? You know, th things like that. You know, what can we do thematically to make these an interesting set? Uh, it's not as obvious. And everything requires not just decisions. That's what you are aware of, naturally, but, but negotiation. And, and the Ragnarok, man, that thing. Yeah. The, 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 the development effort that went into that, where, for instance, it has a, an explosive that it drops in, and the animation depicts that. It drops it into the center of the planet that it's on, and then a timer kicks off, and at the end of that timer, the planet blows up. And getting all of those pieces to dance correctly was way more challenging than you'd expect it to be. And it might be something that when you're starting a project like this, you ask, if we come up with a design like that, are we going to be able to handle it easily? Do we have something where we have a straightforward representation of this? Can we do co-routines? Can we do, can, can we have routines that yield and, and continue? Well, 
often, often you can't if you have to serialize it, but that's a, a different point entirely. Okay, now this, this one I'm gonna dwell on for a moment. It's not as clear as I'd love it to be, but I don't think it needs to be for the current purposes because when you are playing a game like this, you're not looking at anything for long. Your eyes are darting all over the screen. The time that any of these UI elements is even visible is, is often so short that for an expert player, they're, they're not looking at them any, anymore. But we, we have all kinds of little things that, you know, if you look underneath the mouse cursor here, we are, are describing the, set, the stats of the orbital launcher. Up until a, a few weeks before we launched Titans, we had a different interface there. And it was one that, once we asked around, we realized it was literally just there as part of the prototype. It had been done well enough that no one complained. And so we had this very quick turnaround where we had uh, literally a few days before localization strings went out to figure out what we were going to call things in this interface because we hadn't been telling people how much energy it took to run a building. We hadn't been telling them how much, how much metal it would constantly use. We hadn't been telling them how much health things had, seriously. Um, and, and in terms of the game design, it worked out well most of the time. The descriptions were robust enough, people would experiment, they had a good time with it. But these stats were there, the expert players knew them, and we didn't present them in the UI. So we had you know, a very quick turnaround on that. We, we had up here the combat notifications. If you look at the very top, underneath the energy display, there's a planetoid and a little icon. And the icon represents a unit. And these, these were an experimental feature through a good chunk of development. We had a lot of that in place, but all it tells you is what planet a conflict is taking place on, who the main victim of it is right now, and if you hover over it, you'll actually see a, a view of the planet, of the fight taking place, and so you can monitor your armies more easily. We didn't have anything like that before. We had a stream of notifications. Anyone here play roguelikes at all? Yeah? Okay. In the, in, in the action logs, in, in most traditional roguelikes, you end up with those like, you hit the rat, the rat hit you, you hit the rat, the rat hit you, you hit the rat, the rat, you, you tune that stuff out. Well, you, you can't do that because in this case, by the time players knew what was happening, their bases had been destroyed. So it forces them into certain play styles and it's not, it's not ideal. All right. So anyway. That's, that's the bulk of, of 